one time a year into my conversion, I met a Jewish guy named David, and he had a very extensive knowledge of Jewish belief and practice, but he wasn't himself a believing Jew. He was uh, hmm. an agnostic, and it, it just surprised me. I That didn't compute. I didn't understand. Just like some Jews think you can't believe in Jesus and be Jewish, I couldn't understand how he could be Jewish and not be a believer in God. Welcome back to the channel, Jews for Jesus, friends and family. I'm so excited once again to have Anthony Rogers here uh, with us. Thank you so much, Anthony, for for being here once again. Thank you. Thank you. I love to be here. Yeah, me too. So uh, Anthony Rogers, highly respected theologian uh, who defends both Jewish and Christian faith in Jesus. Um, I'm, I'm sure you're familiar with the Books for Dummies series. I remember when that came out and I was so excited because i got to be honest, I wasn't a great student, C's, D's, occasional B, and I just didn't love studying. I was more into the arts. And when the when the Dummies for, uh, series came out, I thought, this is amazing because it breaks it down for me. It's more simple. It's logically explained. And because I can get lost, you know, really, really quickly. I read really slowly. My memory's not great. But, um, you know, they, they, they have books like, you know, Football for Dummies, Excel for Dummies, House plants and succulents for dummies. I mean, really anything you can think of, and even Bible for dummies. Um, you're teaching on how the Old Testament points to Jesus and how the New Testament is the fulfillment of the Old Testament is so rich and so deep. And I've I've gotten into your um, two to three hour teachings on those, which are just amazing. But some people and some Jewish people may be watching right now, and they don't have the time. Maybe they don't have the desire to deep dive into Scripture, which I do recommend anyway. What would be your Jesus is for the Jews? He is for the Jews for dummies explanation. So one of the things that comes to mind when you ask a question like that, for me, you, you might think you, you're asking about Jesus, so I should immediately be going to the New Testament. But honestly, the, the first thing that comes to mind is the book of Genesis. Hmm. In the book of Genesis, God creates the world. He puts man in the garden, perfect conditions, and he creates Eve for him. And they together are to increase and multiply and fill the earth. They're to spread God's name and fame throughout the world. They're to tap the world's resources and, and bring out all that God had put into it and, and glorify God. And, and yet man falls. And on the heels of that, God promised to them a deliverer, somebody who would come and overturn the works of the devil. Yeah. So the serpent tempts Eve, and then she in turn gives to her husband, he eats. But the Lord says, I'll put enmity, talking to the serpent, I'll put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and hers. He will crush your head and you'll bruise his heel. So there you have the seminal promise right. that ultimately develops into what we believe as, as Christians, <clears throat> that, that, that Jesus is the one that was promised. But not moving too quickly away from Genesis, so you, you, you have this promise that, yes, you've fallen, now there's problems in the world, I'm going to correct that, it's going to be by means of one of your offspring. So naturally, this is what people sh would be looking forward to. Eve is looking forward to this. I think it's evident when she names her first son, she says, I have begotten a, uh, she calls him Cain, uh, which in Hebrew sounds like the word for to possess or acquire. And it even says it there in the text. Uh, she named him Cain saying, for I have acquired a man. Mm -hmm. What's interesting is in the Hebrew text, I challenge people to go look at it. The Hebrew text literally says, I have acquired a man, the Lord. It mm. would seem to be the case that Eve thinks that this is the promised child. Now she turns out to be sorely mistaken but it shows her faith in that coming figure. And he ends up killing Abel, who was righteous, and then Abel's replaced by Seth. And you have this warfare continuing through the pages of Genesis all the way up until modern times. This warfare between two seeds, those who believe and those who don't, mm -hmm. those who belong to God, those who don't. And, and along the way, you've got the repeat of this promise. So God repeats this promise in the line of Noah, he repeats it to Abraham. He says, through your seed, all or all nations will be blessed. Abraham is even named Abraham because he'd be the father of many nations. Prior to this renaming, he was just called Abram, mm -hmm. father of many. 
And so uh, you, you've got this promise being passed down through the patriarchs. But here's the thing. Along the way, incredible things are happening in, in, in concert with the, the repetition of this promise, such as, and I can only touch a, a couple of things here within our time, but, and I'm sure you're well familiar with these, and I hope your audience will become well familiar with them if they're not. You've got things like Genesis 22, where Abraham has a child, a seed, and so if you're following the idea here that salvation for the world is going to come through this seed, now the seed in, in the case of Abraham is Isaac or one of his descendants, and yet God tells him to take his son and offer him as a sacrifice on one of the mountains that he would show him, which ends up being in the regions of Moriah. Mm -hmm. And we know that's where the temple is later situated. That's where Jerusalem is. And so here you have a father being told to take his son, his only son whom he loves, and offer him as a sacrifice on Mount Moriah. What's interesting is the word there for only, you know what it is, yachid in, in Hebrew. Yeah. And when the Jewish translators rendered this into Greek, they had two choices of, of what Greek word they could use. This form is used about 12 times in the Old Testament. Sometimes they used one of those Greek words. Sometimes they used the other. Those two terms are agapetos, which means beloved mm -hmm. son, or monogenes, which means only begotten. When you come to the New Testament, the gospel writers use both of these terms for Jesus, calling him God's beloved son or his only begotten son. Mm -hmm. So you have, along with this promise of a seed, all of these events where God is, as it were, foreshadowing what he's going to do in the person of the Lord Jesus. Yeah. You also have the account of, of Joseph, such an incredible account, but to what end? Why is God including this in, in this book that's all about his plan to bring forth a seed who will save the world? Well, what happens in the case of Joseph? He's betrayed by his brothers who don't recognize him for that God-ordained and appointed figure that he claims to be. Mm -hmm. He says that God is going to put me over you, and they don't like that, and they betray him, they sell him into bondage. But then what happens? Many things happen along the way, but to just give the high point, he is eventually exalted to the right hand of Pharaoh, who's the reigning power at the time, and he dispenses life-giving bread to the world, not just to Israel, but to the world, yeah. but certainly to Israel. And he's given a name by Pharaoh, which there's dispute over the actual meaning, but one of the disputed meanings is savior of the world. That's one of the ways that people have understood that Egyptian, that Egyptian name given to Joseph. So think about it. In, in the book of Genesis alone, and I've only given two of the examples, yeah. but this book where it's talking about the coming seed that will save us from what we were plunged into because of the tempter, it, along with this, it's giving us these stories that Christians can look back to and say, hey, that looks quite familiar. Right. In fact, if, if I could tell you a story, uh, one time a year into my conversion, I met a Jewish guy named David. So I mentioned in a previous episode, my father-in-law was named da or is David. This is a different David. And he had a very extensive knowledge of Jewish belief and practice, but he wasn't himself a believing Jew. He was uh, hmm. an agnostic. And it, it just surprised me. I That didn't compute. I didn't understand. Just like some Jews think you can't believe in Jesus and be Jewish, I couldn't understand how he could be Jewish and not be a believer in God. Yeah, But he told me a story one time that blew my mind. It, it, he was talking about how they did a Seder service in, in their family. And so he mentioned making three me meals of bread without yeast, and then how they'd take the middle one and break it and wrap it up. And then the children had to go and find it because they would right. hide it. And then they'd come back rejoicing. And I heard this and I thought, how can this guy not believe? not only in God, but in Jesus as the Messiah. Right. And and I said to him, I said, what does that mean to you? And he says, nothing. He says, it's just something we do. Right. And, and I said to myself and to him, I couldn't keep it back. I, I was like, that's just something you do. I said, that's something I believe. 
That, to me, sounds like the gospel. As a Christian, I believe in God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Right. I think the second person was given for us. He came into the world. He died for our sins on the cross. He was wrapped in burial clothes, put away in the tomb, and then was later found by his followers to be alive. And they came back rejoicing to others and telling them about him. Yeah. So just real quick, the, the, just to, to give the Jewish context of all of this, what you're talking about is the Passover Seder for, and for the Jewish people out there, the, you, we have the, the, the matzah tash. And the matzah tash is the white pouch that contains three layers of matzah. And at, at a certain point in the ceremony, the middle matzah is removed. It's broken. The, the, the top matzah and the bottom matzah remain uh, re- uh, unrevealed, basically unseen the entire ceremony. The middle matzah is taken out, broken, wrapped in a white cloth, buried or hidden, and then brought back. And there's a rejoicing and there's a kind of a, you know, we, we give a gift to those that have brought him back. And the symbol, the, the, uh, the, the parallel and the symbolism and the pointing towards Jesus is so blatantly obvious. And we actually, I, I actually in uh, March, will be going on tour in the States to about 10 churches to teach on Christ in the Passover and how the how clearly the Passover points to Jesus, the Lamb of God who took away the sin of the world. And I'm glad you brought that up. Yeah, and I've had countless experiences like that with with Jewish people over the years. They'll say something, I, I think, what does that mean to you? And they'll say, well, it's just part of our identity. Yeah. And and I think, okay, I, I understand that being included, but that it's only that, that there's not something more to that, uh, that boggles my mind, especially when these things fit together like ball and glove. Right. right. And yeah, when you think that this is all being given in a context, it it all flows from that seminal promise. Right. That's the, the problem is getting back to that situation. And the, the, the God-ordained way of getting back is the promise he made. I'll send a seed. And and so in this context, you're being given these rituals and you think that they have no other purpose right. than, than just to be done? Yeah. Well, some 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 rabbis and religious Jews would say that the, the matzatash represents the, the, uh, the three patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But you still have to answer the question <laughs> of why the middle matzah is broken, buried, and brought back. They Actually, I say, love that though. Yeah. If they say, oh, it represents Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Remember, Isaac, the middle yeah. of those three patriarchs, was taken Bound. on Mount Moriah to be yeah. offered as a sacrifice. Right. And then Abraham names the place a- after the name of God. And he, and he says, on the mountain of the Lord, it will be provided. Mm-hmm. So he speaks of a future day that on which on that mountain where the sacrifice will be provided because right. Isaac wasn't sacrificed. The lamb hadn't been given. Rather, a ram was sacrificed in his place. Right. Yes. And then you have the other explanation of uh, the, um, the three uh, divisions of worship in the ancient kingdom. You got the priests, the Levites, and the, the priests, Levites, and, and uh, people of Israel. And actually, my matzatash that I use actually has tags on each of the, the layers saying priests, Levites, people of Israel. But then again, the question arises is why the middle matzah is broken, buried, and and brought back. And so um, there are different explanations within the Jewish community of why it, but none, none actually makes sense unless, of course, it describes the Father, the Son, and the Spirit, and the Son is the one that's revealed to the earth, broken, buried, and, and brought back, and there's great rejoicing. Amen. Yes. Amen. Yeah. So the the whole thing from beginning to end is telling a story of how God made the world to be a habitation for himself with his people. Yeah. We lost it through sin. He promises to restore it and to do so in a way that it's no longer possible for things to go haywire again. The fact that people are united to this coming figure who is himself the second person of the Godhead is what ensures that this can never go haywire again. And so even though our original situation was glorious, our future end is far more glorious than it ever was in the garden. We are going to dwell with God forever. And, and so it's interesting when you when you look at the, the Bible, it begins 
in Genesis with a with a perfect world and in a garden, and where does it end? In, in the New Testament, it ends in a perfect world with a garden. And I would also argue that even as the end of this story talks about the Lord, the Lamb, and that river that flows from beneath the temple, which is or the throne, which is a symbolic way of referring to the Spirit, you already have that already foreshadowed in in the garden, because it's in the garden that we have, for example. It mentions when Adam and Eve sinned, it says the voice of the Lord, they heard the voice of the Lord walking in the garden in the cool right. of the day. Right. It doesn't say merely that they heard a voice, but it's that they heard the voice walking. Right. I don't know about you, but I don't know voices that walk. So here you right. have already an idea of the word of the Lord. In fact, in Genesis 15, it says the word of the Lord appeared to Abram and said to him. So it's the word who appeared and spoke to Abram. Yeah. So this is the story of the whole Bible. It runs through the whole thing and you can search it without end and find more examples of how it's pointing to this figure, to this story. It, it's not a surprise when you get to the new. If you're following the Old Testament narrative, it's not a surprise when you get to the new and see things unfolding the way they do. Well, yeah. One of the things that that is a curiosity to me when when I talk to Jewish people, I often ask this is, you know, I just think, you know, did the story end? Because when you look at things, if if the New Testament is not continuous with it, then we have no continuation of the story. It, it right. just all ends in Malachi or if they're using a, a Jewish ordering with Chronicles and Thousands of years, the Lord has been silent. There's no temple. There's no sacrifices. There's no priesthood. Yeah, uh, is and that no the Messiah? End? Right. There, yeah. There's, no, there's nothing. Yeah. yeah. But the Bible, if if the New Testament yeah, is taken into account, it fits ball and glove with everything that came before. It continues the narrative, and it doesn't leave us on this cliffhanger wondering, oh, well, why has God been silent all this time? Right. He hasn't been silent. He's he sent forth his messengers into the world to proclaim his fulfillment of all his promises. Mm. All his promises were fulfilled in Jesus, and now we simply await his return, which will take place after people have heard the good news about him and have responded to him. Yes, which is why we do what we do. So, man, thank you so much. And if you haven't seen Anthony's previous episodes, go check them out. Um, where can people follow you and find your work, Anthony Rogers? On my YouTube page, under my name, Anthony Rogers, uh, I'm sometimes in other places on the internet as well, but the, yeah. the main place is, is on my YouTube page. Yeah. Can you share uh, just, a, just a quick little tidbit at the end here? You've had a lot of debates and you've spoken with a lot of religious Jewish people. And, and I have too. And, and the arguments are, are usually the same. What, what are a couple of your favorite moments uh, if you can think of some some really great moments where you're talking with a religious Jew and then the light goes on. Yeah, so after a manner of speaking, the light goes on in some cases. So I mentioned my father-in-law, I think, in a previous episode when I read Isaiah yeah. 52 through 53 yeah. to him. He didn't know what I was reading, thought it was a New Testament passage. His jaw dropped when I told him it was a pre-Christian prophet, Isaiah, he may not have even known who Isaiah was up to that point, right. but he was he was stymied by it. But other things would include one of my favorite things to do is to talk about the Genesis 18 episode in connection with John 8, because in Genesis 18, you not only have the Lord appearing in human form, but he appears for a reason. He makes a promise to Abraham and Sarah that I'll return to you at the appointed time next year and Sarah, right. your wife, will have a son. And I like to ask them, what were they looking forward to next year? And the usual response is, well, the birth of Isaac. And I say, is that it? I, that's big, but is that it? Is that all you get out of those words? I said, what if you heard those words? What if the Lord had appeared to you in human form and said to you, I will return to you at the appointed time next year mm. and Sarah, your wife, will have a son? Then it, then the lights come on and they'll say, oh, I'd be looking forward to the return of the Lord mm. that coincides with the birth of this child, this son of Abraham. 
Now, the reason this is interesting is because on the first occasion when the Lord appeared, it says that Sarah laughed in the tent. So this is a laughter of incredulity. She's she's not responding in absolute faith here. But when the child is born, that laughter turns to joy, and she names the child, they do, they name him Isaac, meaning laughter. So it's no longer a laughter of doubting, you know, sure, but it's now a laughter of rejoicing. They're, they're overjoyed now. So now put this together. You've got the Lord promising he'll return. It coincides with the birth of this son, and it's an occasion of great rejoicing. Yeah. When you come to the New Testament in John 8, Jesus is talking to certain religious leaders, and in that conversation, it becomes apparent that he's claiming a familiarity with Abraham that shouldn't be possible if he's only a man. So, for example, he says, if you were Abraham's children, you wouldn't be trying to kill me. Abraham didn't do this. It's very pointed in Greek. He's not just saying Abraham wasn't the kind of person to try and kill others. He's saying the proof that you're not Abraham's descendants is you're trying to kill me. Abraham didn't do this. He didn't try to kill me. That's what Jesus is saying there. Right. And eventually this leads the the leaders to say, you're not yet 50 years old and you have seen Abraham. And Jesus said, I tell you the truth, before Abraham became, I am. Now, right before that is, is the, the kicker here in light of Genesis 18. Jesus said, your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day. He saw it and was glad. Mm -hmm. So Jesus points back to some day in the past. He's not even talking about that day. He says, your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day. He saw it. So there was some time in the past when Abraham saw the day of Christ, a day of his coming, and on that day he rejoiced. What other day is more fitting than the time when he returned and Isaac was born and they named him laughter and rejoiced and, and so forth? Uh, there's so much more that goes into this, but that sort of thing is found all throughout the New Testament where Jesus yes. is going to the Old Testament and, and pointing out where he's to be found. Yeah, yeah. So I'm going to use that to say and encourage anyone out there, especially uh, my Jewish people, to read our scriptures, open them up and read them for yourselves. I think we're a bit too dependent upon the rabbis. A lot of times I'll talk to someone and say, you know, hey, I'm a Jewish believer in Jesus. And they're like, well, I need you to talk to a rabbi. And I'm thinking, well, I'd love to talk to you because, you know, let's, let's talk together about this. And everybody should know about their faith. Um, the Christian faith is very simple. Um, you know, the gospel can be shared in 10 seconds, 30 seconds, you know. Um, but a lot of times when I ask people, what is Judaism? We have a different answer from everybody. And so I want what my my heart's desire is to see all, all of us saved. Um, but I want our Jewish people to open up the, the Tanakh and read it in Hebrew. Uh, God tells us to study his word. He's not, he's not, uh, um, worried that we're going to discover something that we don't uh, like or or uh, agree with and he's you know he's he wants us all to to come to him so um anthony rogers thank you so much for sharing your your wisdom with us and uh make sure you subscribe to anthony rogers youtube and uh, subscribe to juice for jesus youtube and uh, leave your comments down below in the comment section follow us on facebook instagram and TikTok, and may you all find everything you've been looking for in our messiah yeshua Savior of the world, thank you so much for watching and thank you, Anthony, for being here.